Amen. Praise God. Do appreciate that ministry tonight. Wonderful, wonderful there. Amen. Proverbs chapter 20. Before I start ministering, I uh, just want to say that this week marks four years that my family and I have moved back to Prescott to help assist uh, here in the Prescott Church and just want to, on behalf of my family and I, say thank you. Uh, it's just an incredible privilege and opportunity to be here, to labor alongside Pastor Greg and our staff. Uh, just uh, incredible, all the growth and development, hands-on training, discipleship that continues in my life, and just a joy to labor and partner together here with the Prescott congregation. We love you, and we are so grateful to be here. Amen. Proverbs chapter 20. This evening, the Boston Light is a lighthouse in the Boston Harbor that was originally constructed in 1716. During the Revolutionary War, this lighthouse became a point of conflict uh, between the British and the colonial forces. In 1776, the British forces, they set explosives to this lighthouse and burned it down. And it remained from 1776, burnt down in that condition until 1783. The Boston Light was rebuilt and remained faithfully lit by lighthouse keepers for 215 years. The Boston Lighthouse would have been the last lighthouse in the country to be automated. That was in 1998, but for 215 years, it was faithfully lit by faithful men protecting against tragedy. So I use that as an illustration because in the passage that we're going to look at tonight, it reminds us of our need for faithfulness and the need for faithful people. Faithful people who will commit to being a faithful light for the gospel. A faithful uh, 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 in their marriage, faithful to their family, faithful for their children, faithful to their community. I want to look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, just one passage, reading from the ESV translation. It says, Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find? Finding the faithful. Let's talk firstly tonight about the need for faithful. The Bible declares to us who God is. And he's identified throughout Scripture as a faithful God. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Catch the revelation there is that God cannot deny who he is. It's not like he said, uh, I'll be faithful. Oh, now I have to be that. It is who he is. It, it naturally flows out of God because it's his character. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, The one who calls you is faithful. Again, speaking to God's faithfulness, his commitment to us, uh, to his work in us, that he is going to uh, accomplish and fulfill what he has promised to do because he's committed, he's faithful. Lamentations 3:23. Speaking about the mercies of God. And then it says, great is his faithfulness. God wants us to know how great it is towards us, towards humanity, uh, that he is committed to us. So God felt that this was important for us to know. Right? God, the Bible is God's self-revelation. It tells us who he is. It teaches us. About him, so we have to think why? Why do we need to know that God is faithful? Number one, because it teaches us in his faithfulness that God is dependable. We can rely on him. 
We can count on him in life. We can count on his word. He's going to be there. Secondly, it teaches us that we can trust him. That we can trust always that God will make right come out right in every arena of life. We can trust that he will do right by us. That he has our best interest at heart. We can trust him. Thirdly, in that idea of faithfulness, it teaches us how we should live. Knowing that God is faithful, then we as believers, as God's children, we should inherit his traits. We should inherit who he is and be like him. Respond to life like he would. Act like him. Any of you, you have children. Have you ever seen your children in you? Are, are, so yeah. <laughs> Let me say that again. Have you ever seen your kids do something and it's like, hey, that's me. You didn't teach them it. You didn't show them that. It's like, don't, don't be like that. that uh, but then at the same time, you're like, I know that kid. That kid was me. Because there's things that are passed down. There's things that are inherited. So God tells us, who he is so that we as his children will live like him. So this is a trait we need. We need to be a people of faithfulness like God. But again, you have to think through why. Of course, it would be good just to say that, but think practically. Number one, uh, uh, this is a trait we need because God needs faithful people. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap, in the wall, so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found no one. Think about here is God as he's speaking to Ezekiel, as he's declaring, I'm looking for someone who will represent me, who will build or rebuild the wall of righteousness. But as I looked throughout the earth, I could not find one. What a shame that would be if God is looking to raise up a wall of righteousness. An area opens up, a city opens up, a nation opens up, and there would be no one. Why do we need faithfulness? Because God needs faithful people. Secondly, faithfulness is a trait we need to inherit because it's something our families need. Our families need faithful people. Faithful to their parents, faithful to their marriage, faithful to their children, faithful to their church. We look at Job and the Bible tells us he was a righteous man. And it tells us that every morning he would faithfully lift his children up before the throne of grace, offer sacrifices on their behalf, our families need faithful people. Thirdly, a society needs faithful people. Those who will commit to preaching the gospel to all creation. This is the great commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations, every tribe and tongue. This is what we've been called to do. But who will do that? Faithful people. And society is depending on us. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses entrust these to faithful men who will be competent to teach others also. Pastor uh, Greg has said to pastors, he has said to disciples this uh, uh, statement, you are the link between the past and the future. You're that link. There are things that have been established. The vision, all that we do, it's been established. It's been entrusted to you. But what is going to connect that to the future? You're that link. And so here there's a need for faithful people. Let's think secondly about 
self-declared faithfulness. Our passage teaches us that apparently we can be blind to our lack of faithfulness. Our passage says uh, here in Proverbs 20, verse 6, many a man proclaims. That word man, it can mean literally men. Many men proclaim. But many a man, that root word also applies to human beings. There's a lot of people that proclaim. They can declare. If you were to ask them, are you faithful? Yes, I'm faithful. Are you committed? Are, yes, I'm committed. But yet there could be areas of great unfaithfulness. You can say, I'm faithful, but then it plays out in areas of life. You're not that. There's some, they're unfaithful in their relationship with God. In the fundamentals of salvation, there's a missing element, a missing dimension of faithfulness. You don't pray daily. You don't read your Bible daily. Church, it just depends on the schedule. God gets the leftovers of our time. And we have our reasons for it. No, but pastor, you don't understand. I just don't have time. I'd love to. I just don't have time to pray. I just don't have time to read. Look, I'd be there. I just don't have time to make it ever. And so in that, we leave areas unfaithful. I can't afford to tithe. I, can, I would, but I, all these different reasons. But there's a hole in your relationship with God. There's an unfaithfulness. It could be unfaithful in marriage where purity isn't so pure, where things are not as they should be. Imaginations wander, hearts drift. In your marriage, there's a lack of prioritizing. There's a lack of pursuit, pursuing your spouse. There's a lack of partnership. There's unfaithful areas. It can be unfaithful with our children unfaithful in ministry, unfaithful in our character, unfaithful in our convictions, in our finances, in our word, unfaithful. The issue of this is that it's not just static. It's not just that that's a, a, a problem. You're not, you're not exhibiting the traits of God. No, it has, a, it has results Unfaithfulness will affect your relationship with God. Mark 4, 16 through 17, this is in the parable of the sower. And in that parable, Jesus talks about seed that is scattered. The kingdom of heaven is like, and it's seed that's scattered. And he names different types of soils that the seed falls upon. The disciples ask him, what was the meaning of that? He says, the, 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 the seed, that's the gospel. And the soils are different hearts. And in that, he said, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. So they endure only for a time. And afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises... For the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Unfaithfulness, you won't be equipped for the trials, for the, for the, for the hard, uh, hard times, the hardships of life, because there's that lack of faithfulness. No roots get established. No depth in your relationship with God. In unfaithfulness, your marriage will suffer. What's meant to be a great blessing isn't. What's meant to be a great blessing to your life can't be because maybe issues of sin in your unfaithfulness or issues of neglect or issues that have produced an insecurity. In unfaithfulness, you set a course for your children, right? Because you are the reference point for their lives. Doesn't work in life to live by do as I say, not as I do. Because how you live that example, faithful or unfaithful, 
unfaithful areas or arenas, it's going to set a course for their lives. You set the standard in their lives. You can put them in children's church. You can put them in Sunday school. You can put them in a pew. But your life will speak the loudest to them. You set a standard for their worth and their values. But unfaithfulness could be a trait that's passed down. Ultimately, as you set an example, you might set an example of unfaithfulness for new converts. Can't tell you how many times this scenario has happened in ministry, right? As someone witnesses to someone, they pray and get saved. They come to church looking for who prayed with them. Hey, is so-and-so here? Yeah, about them. I'm not sure where they are. Next service. Yeah, they're not. I, I haven't seen a big building, you know. You never know. Right? But So you set an example. Set an example for ministry. Those who are serving, you're unfaithful. You can be someone's good example or someone's excuse. Yeah, but so-and-so, and they're involved. Yeah, but so-and-so, and I see that they're not always... Set an example for other disciples and how they respond. Like, like calling is just a, 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 another thing you can do in life. Another thing. It's like, should I be a doctor? Should I be a lawyer? Should I be, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A connoisseur? You know, whatever that is. And it's just another area of life. Pastor, maybe, yeah, sure. You set an example. But there is a danger to unfaithfulness. And that danger is when you are unfaithful, you will begin to allow something else to rule. You allow something else to fill that void, fill that area, fill that, uh, that need or that vacuum. And, it can be now that a spirit could have access. A spirit of immorality or a spirit of rebellion or a spirit of laziness or a spirit of carnality. Anthony testified this morning. He talked about how he was involved but allowed in, in unfaithfulness to vows of exampleship He started a lot, and he said it, carnality ruled my life. I had a subscription to every every possible platform known to man that's ever been created. But you allow something else entrance. Matthew 12, 45, then the spirit will find seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all will enter the person and live there. And so the person is worse off than they were before here Jesus is giving warning when we get the get the house of our heart cleaned by forgiveness cleaned in salvation we need to faithfully fill it with God so the challenge or the question is are you faithful are you faithfully maintaining your salvation Are you faithfully maintaining your marriage? Are you faithfully maintaining with your children in ministry, in church, in relationships? The thing about faithfulness is it takes a lot of work. Faithfulness takes work. Faithfulness takes It involves course correction. You're you're attentive to where you're at, where things are, and it's practical. And it takes a commitment. Many a man proclaims, but who can find? Is it there? It will show. So let's close. Let's think about finding the faithful. So how do you become faithful? How do we capture this? How do we inherit this trait of who God is? Number one is we must repent. 
Repent of unfaithfulness. 1 Kings 18, 39, when all the people saw this, they fell face down and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. In 1 Kings 18, the people of God are unfaithful in their relationship with God. They're worshiping Baal. They're involved in false religion and the worship of idols and all kinds of immorality. So God calls Elijah and he goes and he challenges this false religion. And you know the story is the prophets of Baal, they start calling on their false god and nothing's happening. And Elijah takes some liberties and begins to mock them. You know, maybe he's asleep. Maybe, maybe shout a little louder. You know, they start shouting a little louder. You know, maybe that's not enough. Maybe, And he's working this through. Then he builds an altar for God. And he says, God's going to show up. Builds that altar, and the Bible says the fire fell. The fire fell. And when the people saw this, they fell face down. When the fire fell, they repented. They got their hearts right, repented of that unfaithfulness. Let me ask you a question. Why wait till the fire falls and burns you? Right? There's some people that's like, faithfulness takes work. Faithfulness, it takes dedication. Sometimes faithfulness, you know, isn't the most fun thing you want to do, but you do it because you know it's right, because you know it will bless. But why wait till the fire falls on your marriage, on your finances, with your, with your kids, with... No, I'm going to repent. That's step one of becoming faithful. Step two would be to ask God to make you faithful. Ask him to give you this. Psalms 51.10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. If something is missing, that exemplifies God or something God, it's who he is, he wants it in you, ask him for it. Ask him for it. I remember Pastor Greg would say this at different times when I was a disciple. You know, if you have a hard time reading your Bible, ask God for a hunger for his word. If you have a hard time in prayer, ask God to, to guide you to, you know, a, a heart for it. If you're a struggle in evangelism or witnessing, God, give me a heart for souls. If it's faithfulness, the issue is unfaithfulness, God, put it in me. Because if it's missing, the creator can create it in you. Thirdly, is we have to settle the decision that I will be faithful. Faithfulness is a conviction. Pastor Greg has defined conviction as a settled decision. You settle it in your heart. And that starts by committing yourself to God. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That decision... God first, what God would ask of me. I'm going to filter life through my love for God with my whole being. That decision will flow into every area of life. God can deposit faithfulness into you. From there, faithfulness can be found in you. Verse 6 but a faithful man, who can find? Who can find? It can be found in you. That's what God wants to do. Put that into your life. And not just put faithfulness into your life. There is blessing that flows out of faithfulness. Number one, God will strengthen you. Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth. 
in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking, and when he finds someone whose heart is fully committed to him, when he sees the faithfulness, when he sees, that's God, that's the desire of my heart, God says, I'm going to help that. Because I said, faithfulness takes work. And God says, I'm going to strengthen you. God will bless it. Secondly, faithfulness can allow greater blessing to be deposited into your life. Luke 16 and verse 10. If you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. You want growth in, in, in life, in converts. You want growth in, in ministry, growth in, 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 your, in your marriage, oh, every part of life. If you'll be faithful in the little things, God says, I can trust you with more. And he'll deposit more. Thirdly, faithfulness will bless those around you. It was Joseph in the Old Testament who was faithful to God. When, you know, here he's sold into slavery by his brothers and he made a decision. I'm going to honor God. And it was in that that God blessed him in his faithfulness in the house of Potiphar. No, his life, he's thrown in prison, falsely accused, but he was faithful in that prison and he found favor with the jailer. Ultimately, in through that faithfulness, he was faithful to Pharaoh, brought out of prison, and ultimately, God used him to preserve a nation, Egypt, and bless his people, the Hebrews, as they were brought into that land during a famine. Faithfulness will bless those around you in a greater way. I close with this story. When I worked in the emergency department, <clears throat> we had a patient that came in uh, who had been attacked by a hive of African killer bees on his ranch. I don't remember what he did to disrupt that hive, but they began to swarm him. They began to sting him. He's running. It's chaotic. He said that he, it was so bad, just the swarm of these bees. He jumped into a cow pond to try to just get away from him. And he said, he's underwater and they're hovering over the water. He'd come up for air, and they're on his face. I mean, these were evil creatures. Eventually, he was able to get into the ER, and he was swollen, his, his entire body swollen. He was in incredible pain because this venom, it, it, it releases. It, 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 it's very painful, especially if that stinger stays in. He's itching all over and stung everywhere, all over his face, all over his neck, all over his arms, his legs, his torso, front and back. I mean, these things, these bees got a hold of him. And a tech and I spent hours pulling stinger after stinger from his body. Over 300 stingers we pulled out. I, I knew the exact number before, but over 300 meticulously. You know, you work in the ER and it's like, do we have the stinger tool? Yes, it's a pair of tweezers. <laughs> so if you're looking for a stinger tool, it's a pair of tweezers. And so, but meticulously, one by one, taking them out. You know, he was grateful for our faithfulness. It's like, not like after 10, it's like, this is going to take a long time. You know what? Here's the tweezers for you, friend. <laughs> but I thought about that. That's a lot like faithfulness. It's not always these huge decisions. 
These massive moments of which way will I choose to go? Will I be faithful or unfaithful? No, it's in the little stingers that you're faithfully committed to pulling those out in life, to pulling those out in marriage, to pulling those stingers out in your salvation, to pulling those out with your kid, your ministry, fill in the blank, your finances. You make those faithful decisions to get what doesn't belong out. Amen. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, finding the faithful tonight. Thank you for your attentiveness. And before we pray this evening and before many come to this altar to pray and their own needs, I want to give an opportunity for salvation. You're here tonight. You're not born again. You're not right with God. You are, like I said in this sermon, unfaithful in a lot of areas. Maybe it's unfaithfulness in, in your own life, areas of sin that have brought damage, areas of sin that have brought habits, that have brought bondage, addictions, areas of life that you tried to fill the void through maybe money or success or career, but you found yourself still empty. I want to tell you tonight, but that's because what you need is a Savior forgiveness of your sin you need a new start and that can only come through Jesus Christ Jesus who came to earth over 2,000 years ago lived a sinless and a holy and a clean and a pure life and allowed that life to be nailed to a cross for you for the sins of the world he paid in full for the sins of humanity so you could be forgiven, so you could be free from every bondage of addiction, so you could be free from guilt or shame, so you could be free from fear or anxiety or depression, so you could be free from maybe suicidal thoughts that plague your mind. You can be delivered tonight and have a new start, a new life through Jesus Christ. And I wonder tonight, you're here you're not saved. You're not born again, but you want to get right with God. God in his faithfulness, you can depend on him tonight. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll give you a new start. You can count on that. He'll forgive you. You can count on that. He'll heal you. You can count on that. I wonder how many there be. You say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I'm not right with God. But I want to pray tonight. Would you lift your hand quickly? Right now, God's dealing with you. I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. But I want forgiveness. I want a new start. I want a new life tonight. Quickly, yes. Yes, that's me. Yes, I want to pray. Yes, I want a new start. Maybe you're a, a backslidden. At one time, you knew the love of God. You might even know Scripture but this very issue, unfaithfulness, you were unfaithful in your walk with God and you went back, back to sin, back to the old habits, back to the old life. You can depend on God to forgive you tonight or you come and repent. I wonder how many there be, pastor, that's me. Yes, I wanna pray, I wanna give my life to Jesus. You'd lift your hand because we wanna help you to pray right now, amen. God's dealing with hearts. You'd lift it high where I can see it quickly. Amen. Amen. Speaking to believers then. Speaking to Christians tonight. Finding the faithful. Maybe tonight there's areas in your life you identify the Holy Spirit has brought to the forefront. The Holy Ghost has pointed some things out. Maybe you're faithful in some areas but unfaithful in others. Maybe it's altogether. You're, it, it's an area... It, I just, I start things I never finish. I'm unfaithful in them. It's a habit. It's, it's, it's part of your character. God wants to heal tonight and this altar is prepared. I want faithfulness to be found in me. I want faithfulness to be found in my salvation, marriage. Fill in the blank. I believe God's already spoken to hearts. Amen. Let's stand together in this audience. 
Let's stand together. This altar is open. I want to invite you to come and pray. Amen. Christians, if there is a guest here tonight you don't recognize, gently encourage them for salvation as we sing a chorus tonight. Hallelujah. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. Amen. We can stand in the altar space tonight, and I want to help you to pray as you've come forward, amen, contending for faithfulness. Just want to help you to b believe God and agree with God. Let faithfulness be found in me. I want to help you, lead you in a prayer. I want you to say these words. Say, dear God in heaven, I repent of unfaithfulness. And I'm asking that you would make me a faithful person, create in me a heart of faithfulness, and I settle the decision, let it become a conviction that I'm going to be faithful in every arena of life, that you are going to equip me and strengthen me, that I can be a blessing in Jesus' name. Let's give God praise tonight. Lord, we thank you. God, that you are faithful, faithful to forgive and faithful to help. Bring encouragement tonight. Father God, we worship you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We're going to be uh, dismissed this evening, Tuesday night, just our schedule. Tuesday evening, we have a Spanish service in the other building uh, at the front West Main entrance. That's on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Wednesday, we'll be back for our midweek service, prayer at 6 p.m., service beginning at 7. If you would like to sign up for the marriage seminars, I need you to do that tonight, please. Uh, we're, we've, we're past the deadline, but if you'll do that tonight... We do appreciate that. Amen. As we are dismissed tonight in prayer, if I could uh, ask this evening, Mark Porter, you close us in prayer. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for the ability to, to come before you to keep you faithful. God, we ask that you would help us to be 
Amen. Praise God. Help every guest feel welcome tonight. Amen.